Amen. So today we come to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. So let me take a sip of water. Twelve fifteen. Now the ESV says, see to it. it, says watch. It's a very strong word. And it's a word that you know from the Gospels. Jesus used that word in regards to his disciples when they were falling asleep in the garden. He said, watch, watch out. Watch out that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place to repent, though he sought it with tears. Hebrews contains five sharply worded texts that sound the sirens of apostasy. This is the last one. Marked by the initial watch out, plural, it's a call to the entire congregation. It concerns the entire congregation. Everyone has a call to watch out for oneself. I watch out for myself. You watch out for yourself and for brother and sister so that all may continue and finish the race of faith from which there is no return. That is the balance of what we have seen in the previous warning passages in Hebrews, certainly also here. But what sets this fifth warning apart from the previous four is that it highlights the communal fallout of apostasy, likened to a root of bitterness working in the soil, expanding in the soil, and so defiling many. Imagine a church. Start with a very enthusiastic church and fired up for the Lord. And they have zeal and they have good works. They have all that you are looking for in a vibrant church. But as it is foretold in the parable of the sower that Jesus used on so many occasions during his ministry, as hardship and difficulties and persecution arise, it begins to unravel. Some jump ship and abandon the faith. And the congregation now has to ask a few serious questions. Have we failed to watch out for our brothers and sisters who have now become casualties of unbelief, though we thought that they were of us? Have we turned a blind eye to the writing on the wall? And what, I ask you, what do you think would the rest of the congregants take from the exodus of people but to be discouraged? Surely they would not be encouraged because some of the people who left, left under very dark circumstances with very stark implications for them. This was not a laughing matter, it was discouraging. And maybe they were even wondering whether they should also head for the exit. Because the church is marginalized and she stands with her back against the wall in a hostile culture, nothing has changed, situation unchanged.
And this is a portrait of the Hebrews. And this accounts for the fifth and final warning passage. It's a difficult text. And the last thing I want is to obscure it. So let us define the limits, the framework of our inquiry. Like the previous four passages that contain warnings like this, it does not suggest that believers for whom Christ died can lose their status as children. Salvation is an irrevocable gift because it rests on an unshakable footing. Before time, when there was only God, the Father chose his people and he gave them to a son to save them and his blood shed for them in the fullness of time did not create a potential of redemption, but an atonement. And as 9.12 said, secured eternal redemption. So this is eternal redemption secured. So if God's people lose salvation due to sin, it can only mean one thing, Christ's sacrifice wasn't good enough. To secure a real release from the judgment. It wasn't good enough to save to the uttermost. And it was ineffective. And, and this is a necessary conclusion then, God's purpose failed. Now, there are some things that are very unlikely, but still theoretically possible, as you say, within the realm of possibility. This, even if pigs should fly, this is impossible. Because the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Romans 11.29 says, of God's eternal decree. And that decree certainly includes the entire order of salvation from start to finish, including who will be saved and who won't. That said, placing our text in a biblical framework won't take the sting out of it. Its author is concerned with real people in the real world. And apostasy is a real danger for members of a local church. Ask. Ask the Hebrews. And they have become resentful and bitter. They had been ostracized. Some of them imprisoned. Some of them had their property taken away. They had been mistreated on account of the name. And not all of them, but some of them were now staring at the exit. And they had seen people leave already. Returning to the synagogue and they heard their testimony. They said, no, we are okay. We are, we're happy actually. Everything turns out to be okay. We're good. And they were tempted to believe themselves that a return to Judaism where they came from, the faith of their fathers, might be the way forward. Might be in order. But if they departed, their bitterness would go with them and Christ would not. And they would lose all hope, for there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And so verse 15 raises the specter for one last time. Thank God we are through these warning passages. But verse 15 raises the specter of falling short, as the author puts it, of God's grace. E implying that grace has been sought for some time and to some extent it has been sought but not found. 
And this scenario is then anchored in a case study of Esau. Seeking his father's blessing with tears and being rejected. Seeking a place to repent and not finding it. And so the text offers four aspects on apostasy. Number one and two, we've heard these before, so I'll make these rather brief. It's intentionality. Number two, it's harbingers or signs of warning. And number three, which is the merit of this particular one, the contribution of this particular one, the communal effects of apostasy. And number four, it's finality. Apostasy is intentional. It's a deliberate choice to disown and reject Christ after having professed and worshipped him. Esau, who bartered his birthright for a cup of stew, illustrates the idea, verse 16. Trading God's blessing contained in his birthright as the firstborn, trading God's blessing involved a value judgment and it was intentional. Nobody forced him, no circumstance, no people, it was intentional and it was based on a value judgment. So the Genesis narrative shows Esau returning from one of his many hunting forays, famished and exhausted, smells Jacob's cooking. He was not only a world-class chef, but also an accomplished trickster, a world-class trickster. And whereas Esau smelled stew, Jacob smelled opportunity. He said, sell me your birthright and you shall have my stew. And Esau replied, oh, what good is my birthright if I perish of hunger? He wasn't perishing of hunger, not yet, but he had a reason to say this. And then, the author of Genesis steps in and discloses Esau's heart. He reveals Esau's heart and his underlying motive and valuation. Genesis 25, 34 says, Thus Esau despised his birthright. He chose material things over God's promise. Food that perishes over an eternal perspective. It would be shallow, though, if you and I failed to see the implications. Have you ever put more stock in things of this world than in the gospel? Have you ever put more stock in pleasure rather than purity? And even to raise the question, as you know, is to give the answer. We are all guilty of such things. We all have become guilty of trading Christ for something cheap and fleeting by comparison. And we chose earth over heaven. Anyone here who hasn't, I would like to see your hand because I will call you a liar. Because we are guilty of such things. There is no question of this. And you may say, yeah, well, that may be true of lesser choices. But I will never deny Jesus Christ. Well, that has been said before. And he who said it then denied him 
three times before daybreak to save his own skin. And I would judge Peter not to be a man so afraid of what people could do to him. Not him. But he had to learn of his own weakness. And we all do learn the hard way. Besides, all lesser choices, if we choose to argue this way, all lesser choices of this kind, they grow from the same seed. Have you never sung this hymn? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Apostasy, like cancer, lies dormant somewhere within the seed of sin. Sin is a departure and apostasy is sin. It's a very special sin, but it is what it is. None of us, and that's the point, none of us stand in his or her own strength. First John 5.18 says, we know that Everyone who has been born of God, no one who has been born of God, keeps on sinning as if nothing happened. But he who was born of God, and that is Jesus Christ, he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. If Christ did not protect us, as he did protect Peter, and he prayed for him that his faith would not fail, but that he would be renewed to repentance on the far side of denying his Savior three times. If he didn't protect us, Satan would have his way with us. It's only a question of time, because he tempts you from every possible angle, and he tempts you when you don't expect it, or you don't see it coming. A man took an insurance company to court for a small part of a payment that was due against the advice of his knowledgeable friends. And the case, as they predicted, it rolls through all instances to the highest court of appeal. He won. He won the case. But the years of his retirement, and they were few, they have been wasted with fighting. And wasted was his health as well. And after all this, if you can imagine, an agent of the same insurance company knocked on his door, unashamed to reinsure him. He lost his temper and pushed him down the stairs. It cost him everything and he died a ruined man. We have no strength against the evil one, not in and of ourselves. But do you care enough to turn to Christ so as to turn from sin and self? It is he who protects you. It is his protection that you do need. And you are dealing with a real person, brother and sister. And that leads to our second point. Apostasy is a choice, yes, but there are warning signs, harbingers along the path in a gradual decline. The choice to disown Jesus is the consequence of a life that moves away, not toward Jesus Christ. Look at verse 16. As it says, watch out that no one is sexually immoral or unholy or translate ungodly like Esau. Immorality and profanity are not acquired overnight. 
implied is a prevailing pattern of sin, not a momentary lapse of reason, but a path that leads downwards to destruction. And it may seem to you as though these two harbingers, immorality and unholiness, that these two harbingers of apostasy, they've been pulled out of a hat like a rabbit, but not so. They produce a calculated effect in this context because they are looking back to the pursuit of peace and holiness of verse 14, which is the polar opposite pair. And we studied it last week, if you recall. Every church member has a call to pursue people for peace so that harmony and unity, peace, may prevail and be maintained. Esau, in his ungodliness, is the foil of the pursuit of holiness and peace. First of all, of course, um, peace, harmony, unity, they can only be when we pursue one another so that the church as God's holy temple remains. And Esau's ungodliness is the foil of the pursuit of holiness. Rather than to treasure what is holy, he desecrated and despised his birthright and preferred stew over God's promise. So his unholiness is the foil of the pursuit of holiness. Sexual immorality, in turn, is the foil of the pursuit of peace. Why is sexual sin so rampant in our world, arguably more than ever before? Well, there are ostensible, apparent reasons for this. There is lust. There is the desire to prove yourself. There is money to be made and many more reasons. But the bottom line is that sexual immorality is a substitute, a fraud of healthy relationships of our need for interpersonal unity and harmony. And the most intimate form of this is the union of man and woman as God designed it. Sexual sin is distortion. It's a fix and a false one for our need for interpersonal peace and union. And so you see that these two harbingers, sexual immorality and unholiness, are counterfeits of peace and holiness. Do you pursue peace and holiness? Or is your life one of distortions and crookedness? Is your life going in the direction of Jesus Christ or is it going in the direction of popular culture in which sexual immorality and profanity are encouraged explicitly or implicitly? Either way, and in any case, Esau's choice to sell his birthright was of a peace with his whole way of life. Apostasy is deliberate, but there are warning signs on a descending slope. And so next we ponder the communal fallout, and this is the merit, the special contribution of this final warning passage. Verse 15, watch out that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. This image of a bitter, sprawling root 
working in the soil. It comes from Deuteronomy 29:18, And it warns against a public breach of covenant. Blatant sin and broad daylight for everyone to see. And the one who was guilty of it is no single fatality, but a root. And a root is a metaphor for a subversive person, a subversive element in the community. Whatever I do and whatever I tolerate or let others do, whatever I do or tolerate, in public or in private, has an effect not only on me, but others. And it starts with my family. Whatever I do has an effect on my family. It can only be one of two things, good or bad. And of course, the author's concern is with the family of God, with the church of God. This world, as we often forget this, though it is so obvious, is so clear, is so apparent, this world is built on moral truth. And it answers to it. So that, just as in the physical realm, there is cause and there is effect. So in the moral realm, whatever you do produces an effect on the environment. It affects you as part of the environment, but others as well. And you can never cut this out. It's always true. It will always prove true. So setting aside God's word as the text suggests, does not only spurn God, but if unchallenged, leaves the rest with the impression that this is okay. We can do this. This is okay. And in one way or another, you know this is true, we sin in droves. Sinning is easier when we can do it together. We sin in droves and we learn by example for good or for ill. Always true. And once a root of bitterness is allowed to sprout, it works. You don't need to add water. It works its way into our hearts, into, as the author is concerned, the congregation. And this is what the author describes a chain reaction. A snowball, harmless, resulting in an avalanche that you didn't see coming. Stowed away energy, seeking and finding a path of release. A spark causing a forest fire. In nuclear physics, a single stray neutron can create a critical event carrying enough power to bring about the meltdown of a nuclear reactor as you've seen in 1986 in Chernobyl. Or in the case of a bomb, a nuclear inferno. There are chain reactions leading to economic collapse or recession. The 2008 subprime mortgage crisis was one such event. It triggered a domino effect that would not be stopped. And this is the author's point. Barring God's ability to intervene, he can do whatever he wants to, and there is nothing that he cannot do but... From a human perspective, a chain reaction, once set in motion, can't be stopped. 
we tend to think of ourselves as independent agents in relation to the church. Church is important, we say, why of course? But when the chips are down, it is still I, and the church is more like an appendage. And even though I would never admit this, we do tend to think this way. It's always me first. But whatever I do, even my attitude, because my attitude will show eventually, my heart will be revealed eventually, whatever I do has an effect on others, and it can only be one of two things, positive or negative. What I do affects the church, and it matters to Christ, as you can see from Revelation 2 and 3, where Jesus walks among the lampstands. He sees his churches. It matters to him. And a sprawling, bitter root defiles many. And the church becomes a place of grudges, suspicion, and whispering. Rather than a place of the peace and joy of the Holy Spirit. So, apostasy is a choice. And there are warning signs on the downward slope. And there are communal effects. There's a communal fallout. And now to our last point. Apostasy is final. Verse 17 reads, Esau found no place to repent. No place spells finality. And it suggests the scenario of a vagabond. <laughs> Some of you always wanted to be vagabonds, homeless people. Well, here's the picture of a homeless person seeking a place to settle, and he finds no rest. Two things must be understood. First, in the context of the narrative of Genesis 25, Esau lost a blessing that he never truly had. Because on the back of the perplexing twists and turns of this story where people take advantage of each other and are being taken advantage of, where people deceive each other and are being deceived, on the back of all of this rises God's eternal decree expressed in the words of Malachi 1, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And yes, in the eyes of Isaac, Esau's father, whose darling he was, Esau would have been the next patriarch. And in the eyes of his mommy, Rebecca, who favored Jacob, he should not have been the next patriarch, but in God's eyes, he never was. The blessing had always been Jacob's, never mind his conniving ways. And if you ask me if I'm permitted to give you my opinion, and it is no more than that, I'd rather deal with a character like Esau, at least you know what you're at, than someone like Jacob because you don't know what comes next or what he can do. Jacob was no better than Esau. And when you talk about dessert, <laughs> both of them are not even in the ballpark. And Jacob was probably worse by nature than his brother Esau, arguably. But God's decree, and this is an eternal decree. That's a done deal. God's decree was voiced before the twins were born. The elder shall serve the younger. And all the tears in the world could not undo that. And so, Isaac recalling this prophecy 
The elder shall serve the younger finally realized that he had been fighting God on this because he knew of this prophecy because his wife Rebecca surely had shared it with him. It was too important not to. And he would not undo the blessing. Hands off. He let it stand. This was the Lord's doing. God having the final word. Jacob was blessed. And he remained blessed. And if you are one such Jacob or Jacobine, if this is a word, if this is a name, consider yourself blessed. Because nothing that you do or people do can change this. You are blessed. Because of him. No other reason. Because of him. And second, now, in the context of the letter to the Hebrews, finding no place to repent echoes the earlier warning of 6, 4 through 6, which is the fullest of all of them. That it is impossible for those who once have been enlightened and then fall away to renew them to repentance. That is, they find no place to repent. If you recall, in Hebrews 6, enlightenment is an event that can only happen once in your life. Now, there are many moments of enlightenment where God adds light to you. There's only one moment when you step out of total darkness into the light of Christ. And that is what is meant by enlightenment. Like the Hebrews, they had not known Christ and then they heard the gospel and... the. They believed and they were baptized. They stepped out of the darkness into the light of Christ. And that moment can only happen once. And even if a person isn't saved, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, according to John 16, 8, does not necessarily imply salvation. As Jesus said, the, the Comforter will come, the Holy Spirit will come and convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, but not necessarily leading to salvation in every case. And it would be... It would be reminiscent of the words of Matthew 4.15 quoted from Isaiah chapter 9 describing what the Galileans saw once in their lifetime and never again. What they heard once and would never hear again. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light and it was unrepeatable. They were truly enlightened when they saw and heard Jesus. They saw something that they had never seen before and was unrepeatable. There would not be a second like him walking in Galilee or in this world. And that first dawn, understand, when you move out of the darkness of ignorance to Christ and you even profess and worship Christ, that moment of discovery is unrepeatable. You can't unsee what you have seen in order to see it again for the first time. That's impossible. You cannot come to know and then profess to love Christ and then spurn him and reject him and then come to know and love him again and then maybe even repeat this cycle or revolution a second and third time. It won't happen. To use the imagery that lit up the early chapters of Hebrews, the Israelites who left Egypt under Moses and then decided to return to the land of slavery, they weren't given the option of a second exodus. As if God said, all right, you go home to Egypt and when you are ready, you will get a second 
exodus just for you. There was only one exodus in the history of God and his people and of the world. And if you were part of it, you had to see it through. There was no way back. Apostasy is final because ultimately God declares repentance from it impossible. Just as Esau couldn't retrieve his birthright after selling it, spurning Christ after worshiping and professedly loving him won't be forgiven. Nor will there be a place to repent. There's no way back. And I suspect that on one hand you think this doesn't happen often. You're probably right. On the other hand, how many people would have witnessed a rally of Billy Graham, let us say, way back in those days, and hundreds of people came forward to make professions of faith, and let's take 10 of them. How many of them will still be Christians today? And their religious conviction, that was real in the moment, and on the day, it was fervent. And they thought they knew, and they thought they believed, and they thought that they really were forgiven. But where are they today? I would say nine out of 10, nowhere. They don't have a place to repent anymore. They will not be renewed to repentance so as to come to Christ all over again. Maybe it is more common than you think, and maybe it isn't. Who am I to speak of these things? I do not know people's hearts. The warning is real that I do know. It's a real danger for members of a local church. Yet on the flip side of God's eternal decree, not one of God's children can ever be lost. This is what Jesus said in John 6, 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but that I should raise it up. On the last day, nothing, not one, impossible. The foundation of God stands firm on a firm footing. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. The Lord knows those who are his. He knows you. If you are his, he knows you. You will never be lost. You cannot be lost. And I guarantee you, even if you go through dark, dark waters, maybe on account of your own foolishness, you will be renewed to repentance. The word of God will reach your heart and God will not leave you in the dark. And we all sold our birthright, one way or another. We're all prodigals, like the son in Jesus' famous parable. But we have a brother who was in all points like we are, yet apart from sin. We have a savior who secured eternal redemption Eternal redemption secured. Period. You believe it. You know it's true. If you are one of his, you know it's true. And unlike the elder brother of the famous story, Jesus did not begrudge us the fatted calf. He made himself the lamb and was slaughtered for us. And unlike the elder brother, he did not begrudge us the festive welcome in the father's house. He went to prepare a place for us. And he gave himself up 
so that all may be ours. And he died so that no repentance of ours, even if it is imperfect and we need to repent again, in most cases we do, will be rejected. And he died so that we may work out our own salvation with fear and trembling because it is he who works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So, watch out that no one fails to fall short of God's glory, God's grace. Let's pray. Father, we are shaken by texts that speak such sharp words. We know each man, each woman, boy and girl, we know the burden of our hearts. We know that in us dwells no good thing. But we also know you. And even if our heart condemns us, you know all things. You know your own. You know us. We seek refuge in you. And we find relief from the fear, from the anxiety, and even from our own selves. Father, we thank you that our salvation is in your hand and that no one can snatch us out of them. We thank you that you have made a promise not only to begin but to finish the work so that we will also finish our race of faith. And we thank you, Father, for every hardship, every difficulty, every deprivation, everything that hurts us, along with all the blessings that we receive from your gracious hand, that all prepares for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Thank you, Father, in Jesus.